Hey, welcome to Adventures in Angular, the podcast where we keep you updated on all things Angular related. This show is produced by two companies, Top End Devs and Envoy. Top End Devs is where we create Top End Devs to get top end pay and recognition while working on interesting problems and make meaningful community contributions. And Envoy, which provides remote design and software development services on a performance basis. So clients only pay when tasks are delivered and approved. In today's episode, we will talk about server-side rendering in Angular, all the nuts and bolts that comes with it. So we're going to talk about uh, what is hydration, pre-rendering, rendering, HTTP caching, a lot of stuff that is baked in that. And we will also try to cover some of the improvements that we had to SSR in Angular 17. My name is Lucas Paganini. I am the founder of Envoy and your host in the podcast. And joining me in today's episode is Armin Vardanian. Hey, everyone. Seems like I missed a couple of episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always good to have you. Uh, it's nice because when you join, I already know that it's going to be packed with content. Every time that you join, it's like, you know, Armin always joins. And before we start recording, he tells me, I have so much to say. And I'm like, Okay. <laughs> yeah, so uh, well, that's great. Thanks to the Angular core team, we have content for years to come, I guess. <laughs> yes, yes. They've been very, very busy. Uh, okay, let's get into it. So first, let's just explain what is server-side rendering, because I'm sure that there are, might be people out there that don't even understand what it is. And then we can go into why that's important, the benefits, pros and cons, and then we can talk about the features. So Armin, would you like to tackle that question? Oh, sure. I have recently relearned uh, a lot of stuff about server-side rendering. And um, of course, this is a feature that has been long present uh, in the Angular ecosystem. It's like the concept itself was not new, but we have lots of new improvements uh, and yeah they were gonna touch them a lot so initially what's like server size rendering why would we want it so when we build a like classical angular application um, what we get is a, a client side rendered application so what, what what that means is that like in general uh, when you go to some website you would receive a bunch of HTML and probably some JavaScript inside. And the browser will first render the HTML and maybe the JavaScript itself will also render parts of that page dynamically. Uh, so classically, you would just get some HTML and the browser will just immediately proceed to painting it, rendering and painting it in the viewport, okay? Uh, so that is, of course, perfectly acceptable, but uh, the community and uh, all the cool UI uh, people uh, wanted like a mobile application feel in the browser. And we get that with client-side applications, uh, with client-side rendering or single-page applications, like what we say, right? Uh, and single-page applications don't really have much of HTML. Essentially, you get like an index HTML file that has reference to a bunch of JavaScript files. And then those JavaScript files will render our UI. So when I say these JavaScript files, we mean uh, Angular source code. We mean uh, our own code that we uh, authored uh, in, in the, uh, with the purpose of rendering some UI and adding some uh, dynamic stuff to it, OK? Uh, so uh, in that scenario, the JavaScript will emulate everything that is related to the application's life. It will render, it will provide routing. So if you click on a link, you will sort of go to another page, but not really go to another page. What happens is that the content gets replaced and uh, a special API is used to push this new URL uh, into the browser's history. So it feels like you are navigating, but in reality, you are not going anywhere in the sense that you're not making new HTTP requests, downloading a new HTML page, re-rendering, and so on. And it's a cool thing. It's a really awesome thing, uh, evidenced by the fact that when uh, single-page apps like were created initially, everyone was crazy about them. Oh, let's make a single-page app. Let's make a single-page app. But like with anything, it has its own downsides. So one huge downside is the 
uh, uh, SEO problem, the search engine optimization problem. So essentially, like web crawlers like Google and Bing and so on. Uh, when when we search on Google, it has a big database of websites with keywords. So this 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 is found on those pages and so on. So how they know those pages have that content is that they use a program. It's called like a web crawler that would go around the web, find new pages and index them into the database. So the problem with web crawls is that those web crawls usually are like browsers. They will get an HTML page and they will record whatever you have on your page okay, and index it. And in the future, if you have, I don't know, a cooking website, someone searches something related to cooking, your website will probably be found somewhere in the Google database. But the single page applications, as we mentioned, they deliver only just empty HTML with some JavaScript. So often web crawlers will just say, oh, oh, you know, this is like an empty page. So your single page application most probably will not be ranked and indexed by Google. So yeah, that's a big blow if you are uh, creating a website that is not like a, like not an enterprise solution, but more like an e-commerce or marketing or whatever, that you need people, you need traffic, you need people coming to your website. And if people cannot find your website on Google, um, you are toast, right? <laughs> and uh, so this is one problem that we didn't have with the server side approach when we had all the HTML. And of course, another problem is the initial page load. So with uh, when you get the prepared HTML file, it's fast rendering. Uh, it immediately proceeds just render the HTML. But with uh, client side rendering, we have an empty HTML file. Then you have to download a bunch of JavaScript. Then that bunch of JavaScript needs to be compiled and then it needs to run. And then it will start rendering the UI. Uh, and again, after it has finished rendering, it works way faster and smoother than server side rendering when you have to like throw away the old page and build one. But this initial loading process is slow. And for again, for websites that depend on traffic a lot, that want more users, that want clicks, that want like marketing stuff and so on, uh, initial page load is a very crucial metric. Like people don't like websites that load in like five seconds. Okay. Uh, and that's pretty understandable. So uh, it, when back in the day, Angular only had a SPA, single page. Uh, but uh, I, I don't exactly remember from when we got Angular Universal. Angular Universal, the previous solution for Angular in with server-side rendering. So what it meant is that uh, Angular itself, its rendering engine, can not only run in the browser, which is understandable for us. Like in the browser, okay, it uses like document, add, add element, create element, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's understandable for us how it works in the browser. But it also can work on other platforms. It can work on a server, like, like a node engine, node rendering engine, like we have like Pug, right? Or stuff like that. Uh, it can work like that. We can tell a Node.js server, you know, use Angular to render HTML pages on the server side. And it's really possible uh, because we, when we go to the main TS file, usually in a classical setup, you will see uh, some imports from Angular slash platform browser. So platform browser contains all the stuff that you need to run your Angular app in the browser. So if you're building for a browser, then uh, sure, uh, no problem use platform browser. But you can also use platform server and you can use Angular Universal. Well, you could use Angular Universal before uh, V17, okay? Uh, you can do server-side rendering with Angular. You can have a server, like a Node.js server, that would render the pages in the backend and then serve prepared content, okay? So this is essentially what server-side. Uh, you render on the server-side, you serve ready HTML, and uh, both your SEO and uh, initial page load improve significantly. That's what server-side rendering is in this context. Okay, okay. So um, <clears throat> if we try to summarize and kind of condense everything, basically um, when you're 
coding Angular, you have single page applications which are rendered in the browser, which means that if you inspect the HTML that is being returned from the server, instead of the old days with PHP and Apache servers where you would have the HTML with all the information, you only have the HTML like referencing a script tag and that script tag contains everything. So that is a problem for crawlers such as uh, the Google crawler because it's harder for them to index your website to understand what content you have so that they can show you in the search results. So server-side rendering is a way for you to, uh, instead of returning this empty HTML, you can make sure that in the initial page load, it already returns all the rendered HTML that the page is going to have so that both improves your, improves your, uh, your ranking on search engines and it also increases your uh, it increases the speed of the first the what's the call the first time to render I forgot the uh, so, term. Uh, I know I guess you refer to time to first byte uh, that that can also be improved but with another yeah. SR technique uh, I think it's like initial page load is, isn't it? initial page load page yes load. Yeah, yeah. yes that's the one uh, yeah mm -hmm. okay so these are are the main benefits that we get. Yeah. Now, what are the cons of server-side rendering? It sounds cool. Who should not uh, do it? Uh, the interesting thing about the cons in this scenario is that whatever I say about like, oh, you know, right now this is a downside. It's either a problem that has been fixed. So you don't really have it anymore in like version 16 or 17. Or it is something that's going to be addressed anyway. Uh, uh, okay, let's talk about some uh, things that you need to consider. Uh, I wouldn't exactly call those cons, but those are things that you need to be mindful of. In general, your Angular components will be just rendered on the server side without a problem. So if you're using just Angular, uh, like using template and bindings and whatever, you have no problems in that regard. Angular would just easily render that on the server side, no questions asked. The problem comes when you sort of try to leave Angular itself inside an Angular app and try to, for example, manipulate the DOM manually. Uh, if you say, I don't know, uh, document, uh, query, uh, how was it called, query selector, and find an element and maybe change a property or I don't know, manually remove something. And that is something that might happen. That is a scenario that, I mean, Angular is great, but sometimes you want to manually do something with the, I mean, virtual scrolling, whatever might, uh, you might need to do that anyway. It's not a very popular scenario, but it isn't unheard of either. So the problem is if you start coding like that, if you reference window, if you reference document and so on in your code, well, that's not going to work on the server. Server doesn't have a document uh, object. It's, it's a server. It's not a web browser. Document and window and navigator, history and so on. Those BOM or DOM um, APIs, they only exist in the browser. Like you couldn't access, for example, file system in the browser, right? It's a Node.js thing. So, so the same goes the other way. You cannot access DOM because what DOM? There is no document object model on the server side. So if you have to do these manipulations, it can get kind of tricky depending on what you're trying to do. Well, it used to get kind of tricky until version 16 uh, because now... Uh, the, the problem was that you usually put that sort of code in lifecycle hooks, okay? Because if you put that code in some method and then call it that method only when the user clicks on a button, for example, then you're guaranteed that that code will run only in the browser, right? Uh, so, okay, that, that sort of code wasn't the problem even previously. But what if you want to do that manipulation, for example, uh, when the component starts rendering? like ng on init. The problem with ng on init is that it's going to also run on the server side, okay? And on the server side, you're going to get an error saying, you know, document is not defined. Like, what are you talking about? Uh, 
Uh, now, starting from Angular v16, we have two methods uh, after uh, after render and after next render. Well, not exactly method; they're just functions, which can take callback, and those functions guarantee that uh, the callback only runs on the client side. Okay, you can just put those functions in the constructor and provide any callback, and you're guaranteed uh, the callback will only work in the browser. So now you're sure, okay, this code, only client side. Uh, and after next render works only once, and after render works after every rendering cycle, okay? Uh, essentially, in the end of the day, they just have mildly different behavior, but they, they're the same. They provide you with the capability to clearly say, oh, you know, this code is gonna work only in the browser. So that's probably the main problem that people uh, encountered with, you know, server-side rendering when they wanted to do manual DOM manipulations and so on. Uh, and of course, it has a bit of a learning curve, but it's not that hard. Like, you don't add lots of overhead to your project for the SSR. Everything works as it used to. You just got to be careful about the client-side versus server-side thing. And now we got us covered. And the good news is in Angular 17, those two functions are now stable. So feel free to use them if you're doing SSR in Angular v17. Yep. Um, another cons is that you're putting more load in your server, which is serving the, the front end. Uh, so right now, if your server is just sending out static files, then that is so much easier. Like the server can just cache that and, and return it kind of immediately. But if you're trying to do server-side rendering on the spot, so that means dynamic server-side rendering, then once you make a request, the server will have to render the entire page before returning it. So all the work that the client's browser would have to do to paint the page initially this will be done in the server before it gets returned. So that might decrease, well, it's definitely going to decrease uh, the amount of requests per second that your front-end server can return to clients. <laughs> uh, the good thing is that since all those things, they are stateless, you can just have more of those servers running in parallel and put a load balancer in front of them. So it's not really a scalability problem. But if you have like a lot of users requesting uh, your website at the same time, then you're going to have to think about caching those pages, caching the rendered pages, or deciding if you want to really server-side render all of the pages or just some of them. Maybe you can like pre-render like the home page or something like that, and then you, you can serve that, but the rest you can just serve it and let the client render it in, in the front end. So you can have a, a fine grained control uh, if you choose so. But yeah, it's definitely gonna, uh, your server is definitely gonna take a hit. It's uh, it's really awesome that you would mention that because uh, especially pre-rendering, because the funny thing is that in Angular 17, well, now Angular Universal is gone. We have uh, a package called Angular slash SSR built in. And with Angular SSR, we have pre-rendering, we have SSG, static site generation. And we have this pre-rendering by default, actually. The default option is pre-rendering. So what happens there is that uh, when you build your application, I'm not talking about like serving it on a server, where when you run ng build, what Angular SSR would do is it would go through your routing find all the pages that are not parameterized. So all the routes that don't have like path parameters, okay? not the paths that have like slash ID or whatever, just casual paths. And pre-render those pages, okay? You can pre-render those pages and that HTML, like if you have a homepage, you mentioned a great example. A homepage usually like looks the same, okay? Uh, and even if there are whatever differences, we can, for example, resolve them on the client side. We just want to serve the page immediately. Well, now you can have the homepage pre-rendered. Even better than this, if you have like a limited set of collections, like you have a parameterized route, OK? 
okay? But you know that those uh, parameters are predetermined. Not, not like a user ID that could be anything and you have, could have an, any number of users. But no, like you have some option that there are like four types of these parameters. Uh, you like can a add category a, of blog posts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah, exactly. Like you have a, I don't know, web store and you have a category of, I don't know, clothing items, for example. And you know all your categories. You have like 22 of them. Okay, you can just create a route.txt file and put all the available options there. Angular will now go and say, oh, okay, I can now discover these routes. I can now pre-render them, pre-render the page for this category, that category, that category, or whatever your parameter is. And pre-rendering is actually by default. So you don't even need to worry about it. You can, if you build a static website, like if you're building a personal website, you can just SSG your application. You can just add Angular SSR, build your app like a usual Angular app, and then run ng build. Oh, okay, you have a in the dist folder, you're gonna have a browser directory and we'll just have all the stuff that you need to put in the server to serve uh, for the potential clients. And this is really awesome because it solves all the problems that we kind of have with, like, look, uh, if we, uh, again, with the client-side rendering, uh, obviously, yeah, server is only serving, like, static HTML that will now on the client resolve, blah, 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 and do everything on the client. But your server is probably a more capable computer than whatever your users are running, right? So if you pre-render, if you do all the optimizations and now only the really dynamic stuff is left to render, as you said, on, on spot, then you have got yourself a very cool deal. Like your server isn't gonna suffer that much. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and, and again, that also has uh, some caveats. For example, if you pre-render and you just return the, the cached uh, pre-rendered assets, then you can't serve different, for example, uh, okay, a homepage, let's pre-render that. Okay, but what if this homepage shows a widget that is specific to the authenticated user? then you can't really do that because uh, your pre-rendered it's gonna is gonna be like an unauthenticated pre-rendered version of the page. So if you if you have major differences in case the users are authenticated or not, then you're definitely gonna still have to rely on dynamic rendering. Uh, interesting that like each caveat you say we just move one step to the next improvement we have in SSR. We resolve that problem with the client side and specifically client side hydration. And it's now way cheaper to solve that problem. Uh, essentially what like what you are saying is that obviously on the server we cannot pre-render uh, uh, authenticated content, right? For example, because, well, who knows if the user is authenticated or not. Uh, what we can do, we can use a combination of the functions that I mentioned. We could use a Boolean flag and only check for that stuff on the client side. Uh, then we can use pre-render to pre-render the static parts of the page. And then on the client side, we gotta uh, we gotta enjoy the benefits of client side hydration. Okay. And we can be sure that this problem is gonna be resolved as fast as possible in the context of, you know, this uh, whole uh, client-side re-rendering process. Uh, I, I, I feel like we need to start clarifying what client-side iteration is. So the, the, the thing with, I mean, like the main problem actually that we didn't touch that existed previously with SSR in Angular was the following. So even if you build a, a server-side application, when the client gets the page, we still want them to enjoy all the benefits of client-side Angular. We want the dynamic page. Uh, we want, like, if you click on the button, we want to pop up to 
come up and the dialogues to work and the single page navigation to work and so on and so on and so on. Uh, so the thing is, it wasn't really possible previously. Like it, it worked, but the way it worked wasn't very good. So what would happen is, like if you have a client side application, purely single page up, uh, what happens is that your templates that you create, they get translated to some JavaScript code that then Angular uses to actually render this UI that you have. Uh, and Angular uh, checks for bindings. So we have bindings in our code, like we bind some uh, HTML element properties to our class properties like in components we uh, do text interpolation uh, and so on there are different uh, we do event bindings and so on and so on so when angular on the client does the rendering the bindings are really easy we can just imagine that every time it encounters a binding in your let's say template the javascript that got translated from your template it will just Let's say I'm just saying it as an example. It's not exactly how it works, but let's say it just keeps the reference to this binding in an array. So next it can just go through that array and see, oh, okay, this binding changed. I need to show new UI. And that's how Angular is dynamic, change detection and so on. Uh, and that again is easy because Angular already is rendering those DOM elements in the browser. Okay, so it will just take the reference to the DOM elements and say, oh, okay, here's a binding. I will update this DOM element when blah, 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 something happens. But it's server-side rendering, you've got yourself a problem. You already have all those DOM elements, okay? So Angular is not rendering anything on the client side. So how is it going to bind to all the stuff and know, okay, that button has a event listener. I've got to listen to it, click events. Um, so turns out it couldn't. So... In order for the bindings to work, what would happen previously, prior to Angular v16? What would happen is your application uh, HTML would come from the server, render. Okay, you have nice SEO, you have nice initial page load. But <laughs> now Angular on the client side uh, will be download uh, the Angular code itself. And then it will just demolish the page, essentially, under the hood and re-render it again from scratch um, as it would in the client-side scenario. Uh, of course, it had optimization and so on. It wasn't that bad, but it still wasn't like the optimal scenario. Like you, you have the HTML prepared. Why would you want to throw it away and re-render it again now on the client side? And it, of course, uh, worsened some other metrics like time to interact it. Uh, you would still wait for JavaScript code to download. Uh, after that, you would wait for it to compile. You would wait for it to demolish the page, build it again, add all the bindings. Oh, and now it's interactive. So those other metrics improved, but this metric actually got worse with uh, whatever setup we had previously. So for that reason, we now have what is called client-side hydration. So what hydration does is essentially, instead of throwing away your application DOM that you got from the server, there is a process that Angular uses. If it sees that, oh, okay, I'm gonna hydrate, instead of uh, throwing it all away and re-rendering, it will discover the bindings Inside, uh, inside this template, I mean, not template, inside the HTML, the prepared HTML that you got from the server. It will find the bindings and latched onto it and continue working as if it had rendered those DOM elements, okay? And that's actually a really cool thing. And the most awesome thing is that, like, to enable it, you just need to add provide client hydration in your main TS file, and that's it. Yeah, you don't need to do anything, like literally. You just add provide client side hydration and it works. Uh, and the good news is uh, from Angular v17, client hydration is stable. So again, feel free to use it in your production code bases. API is not going to change anymore. So yeah, that's a really awesome addition because now not only you have the benefits of server side, but you have also like, 
very decent uh, time to interactive metric, very decent largest contentful paint metric. So you're not gonna show a big image and then throw it away, re-render it again, show the big image. Uh, and in a case of like heavy website, you gotta have some flickering and whatever. The, all those problems are solved with plan side hydration. Okay. And it goes even further, right? Because it's not just reusing the HTML elements that were already there uh, when the application was bootstrapped. It's more than that. It's also reusing the HTTP requests that were made in the server when it was being rendered on the server. So there's actually um, a way for us to enable HTTP caching. Um, I think it's much easier now, but uh, in previous versions, if you're still on previous versions, there's a, a state transfer module, I think that's what it called. And basically what this does is it transfers the data that was made during the requests made in the service side rendering process into the front end so that when the front end loads, it can reuse the data that you that the server um, got from these requests so that the front end doesn't have to remake those requests because they were already done when it was being rendered on the server side. So yeah, this is basically like one step further into the hydration because it also kind of hydrates even the data itself, not just the, the snapshot of the elements. It's actually not even an option. Like if you enable client-side uh, client hydration, you get HTTP transfer cache by default. You nice. Actually, if you don't want it, you have to manually add like no cache. Uh, there is a with transfer options uh, function that you can add to your provide, provide client-side hydration. Uh, actually, there are so uh, like niche but really cool features, uh, really cool options there. For instance, you can uh, you can add um, well by default it only caches a get and uh, options requests, right? So uh, it makes sense because. Usually you make post requests, delete requests, and so on. You make those types of requests to modify a data in the database, not to change something in your HTML. And it's the get requests that are kind of the ones that are impacting your UI. But you, if you are in a scenario where using a post request to a post method request to get data, actually, which is a scenario which feels odd but happens way more often than you might think. One reason, by the way, for that is that like, if you're using query parameters, query parameters are limited in size. So if you have too many parameters for a GET request, you just kind of have to convert it to a POST request instead of full body. So if you are in this scenario, you can just add uh, cache HTTP, uh, sorry, how was it called? Let me, yeah, you can, <laughs> you can add the include POST requests option just make it true, and it will gonna cache post request. On top of that, uh, the headers are not cached by default, but if you need the headers. Okay, uh, I can see that Armin is having some connection issues. But yeah, let me just uh, summarize this and try to bring another way to, to fixate this knowledge in your minds. So basically hydration, is imagine that your application is literally in the desert, okay? So uh, when you do server-side rendering and you return all that already rendered HTML to the, the client, uh, all, that, all that HTML is not interactive yet. Like it's not listening and handling client interactions. For example, let's say that you render from the server and then you return a button. If you try to click on the button, it's not gonna do anything because the button element is being rendered, but it doesn't have a click event listener attached to it. So it's almost as if you have all the structures, but they are dead, almost as if they are dry, they are dehydrated, okay? And then the hydration process is kind of like bringing that back to life. So in the hydration process, 
you will, it's almost as if you have a lot of plants and they're like super dry and then you, you water them and they come back to life. So that's what Angular is doing. And instead of, of cutting down everything that is there and, and recreating everything, is keeping those structures there and just bringing them back to life, re-adding the uh, the event listeners to them so that they can become uh, so that they can become interactive again. So this is what client side hydration does. And then another benefit that we get from Angular specifically is that it not only hydrates the elements, meaning that you don't have to, the browser doesn't have to recreate those elements, so it's faster, but it also caches all the HTTP responses, not all, sorry, the, by default, it caches the get request uh, responses that the server got during the server-side rendering process, and it transfers them to the front end so that the front end doesn't have to make those requests again. So this is what uh, client-side hydration does. And um, well, I think we can actually start wrapping up from here because most of the major points that we needed to cover in terms of server-side rendering specifically with Angular were already covered. So uh, I don't think there's much else that we can go in here. Um, but yeah, in general, so, oh, and Armin is back. But yeah, Armin, I was just trying to summarize everything that we discussed and try to give uh, everyone uh, kind of a guideline as to how to choose if they're going to implement server-side rendering in their applications or not. As Armin said, implementing server-side rendering has become much easier than it used to be, uh, but it's still not a super easy process. And it's very important, for example, that the libraries that you're using, if you're using third-party libraries, that they, uh, that they were made so that they can work in the browser and also on the server. Otherwise, if the libraries that you're relying on are trying to access browser APIs, such as window, document, et cetera, then they're going to fail and you won't be able to server-side render. So if you're starting an application from scratch, I would recommend to enable it just because you get some performance benefits and then you already start with the most strict setting possible. Um, but if you already have a big enough application that is not doing server-side rendering, it's definitely not a very trivial process to convert to it, unfortunately. Uh, I mean, to set up the initial structure is pretty easy, but to make sure that your entire code base works on the server, um, it's not that easy because maybe we're talking about years of developers working in this code base without having to worry about wrapping around their calls to document and window APIs, which by the way, you can access. That's one important distinction that I don't think we made, Armin. Uh, you can't still access the document, the window, et cetera. You just, first, you either do it in the way that I would recommend as a best practice, which is you can inject the document from Angular Core. And that way, if you're on the server side, uh, then you're gonna get uh, not like the native browser document, but uh, an object that simulates the document on the server. Or if you really only want to access it in the browser and you don't care about accessing it in the server, then you can either use the lifecycle hooks that Armin uh, discussed that Armin mentioned before, or you can inject the platform ID. So in your constructor, you can inject the platform ID and then you can call a function from Angular, which is, is platform browser, and you pass it the platform ID. And then if you're running on the browser, it's going to return true. So you can just wrap it in this if statement, and then you can, own, you can have a part of your code that is only going to run in the browser. Um, so that's, that's actually very common to be, to be done, even if you're doing server-side rendering, because there are things that you only want to do in the browser. For example, I have 404 pages that they have a timer to redirect the user to the homepage. So you go to the 404 page, and then it has like a 10-second timer. 
and it shows, hey, we'll redirect you to the home in 10, 9, 8. I can't do that on the server because if I do, every request takes 10 seconds because it's like waiting for the observable to end. And then it, it always returns the home page instead of the 404. So that's the kind of thing that you want to only run in the browser. Uh, so you can always do those things, but it's definitely something else that you have to keep in mind. And it also increases a bit the complexity and understanding of your code base by the other developers. So it's definitely not a uh, a trade-off that we can easily discard. I think it, it needs to be to be considered, but I would definitely recommend uh, server-side rendering your applications if possible. Uh, I think the same actually. Uh, if you are, if especially if you are working on like your own product, it always could be beneficial keep server-side rendering in mind. I mean, um, obviously, if you know that the solution is not intended for like public use, if you don't really care about the metrics, then probably you don't need to uh, worry about it. But the cool thing is that it's now also easy to add server-side rendering to an existing project. You know, well, in the sense that you can just run ng add angular SSR. It will generate the stuff that you need to server-side. Then you can sort of address things that you, you know, need maybe to change or uh, migrate a bit to work better with SSR, like the scenario you mentioned. Of course, it's always going to have problems. In some part of your application, you probably have something that isn't really tailored to work on the server side. So you got to be careful about that. But the process of adding and then getting to that actual stuff that you need to fix is quite easy now. Yeah. Yep, I agree. Okay, um, I think that's it. Um, Armin, do you think there's anything else that we need to cover before we finish this episode? Uh, I would just mention uh, the other things that probably are on the horizon for clients, uh, for, for SSR in general. So uh, the client-side hydration that we mentioned uh, is uh, a full hydration. So the entire app that you have, all the bindings are gonna get rehydrated, which isn't bad, it makes sense, but uh, you could get even better time to interactive metric if you do like partial hydration. For example, hydrate only the bindings that are in the viewport and continue hydrating the rest of the stuff in some other scenario or strategy. And probably, I'm not, I'm not sure when or how, but it is possible, it's probably a goal of the team that is working on the SSR package to get us also partial client-side hydration. And it will be even a further improvement in all of this SSR thing. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, all right. Uh, let's go into promos. So my promo is just gonna be Envoid. So uh, it's unvoid.com if you're interested in staff augmentation or just fully outsourcing your project. Envoid can do that in a performance basis. So clients are only going to pay after the tasks are delivered and approved. So if you don't appreciate the, the quality of the work that was delivered, you don't have to pay. So you're completely protected uh, as a client, which means that they're actually gonna deliver that because if they weren't gonna be able to deliver the, a good quality, why would they offer that guarantee, right? Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in that, go check out unvoid.com, U-N-V-O-I-D.com. How about you, Armin? Uh, uh, I think in a week or two, I'm gonna have a pretty big announcement, especially for people uh, who listen to this podcast and are stuck on some earlier Angular versions. I wonder how to upgrade, what new stuff is going on in Angular. There is some cool stuff that is coming your way, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a link to that great stuff, and after that, I will make the announcement. So hopefully, maybe next week or the other one. But it's a pretty big thing, so you know, stay tuned. <laughs> nice, nice. I've been waiting for that for a while. Okay. <laughs> I want to break the news to everyone. Okay, okay. We'll wait a little bit longer, Armin. 
Um, okay. Again, thank you so much for being on the show, man. Uh, I appreciate every time that you can join. You always bring a lot of a lot of content for us. So, yeah, it, it's always great to have you on the show. Oh, no worries. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. And until the next one.